Welcome back to another episode of Timeless Dialogues. And today we're going to talk about one intellectual figure that completely, utterly changed my life. And that person is Dr. Francis Schaefer. And what I want to do today is I want to give you some specific reasons why you should read Francis Schaefer. And, you know, there's a lot of people today who think Francis, who, who's, who's this Francis Schaefer that you're talking about? Like, who is he? Why is he important? And why should I read him? And I want to answer those kinds of questions today because no figure probably equipped the evangelical church to think in concepts of worldviews and how ideas have consequences than Francis Schaeffer. In fact, many of the big apologists that we think of that have passed away in recent years were working off of the foundation that Francis Schaeffer already laid in society. So for me, Francis Schaefer was a figure that I came to know while serving a church in Cabrini Green, Chicago, Illinois. And for those of you who are unaware of Cabrini Green, it was basically one of the most notorious housing projects in all of the United States of America. And I was serving at a church at 515 West Oak Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60610. I still remember it to this day. And if you went there today, it would be a vacant lot. And that's because Cabrini, in many respects, was, like I said, it was the epitome of a housing project, and they tore it down. I mean, the church is no longer there. There are other churches in the area, but the church that I served at is now just a relic to history. Um, interesting thing about it is that the church building was an old Catholic school, and rumor has it that Al Capone used to actually send his kids to that exact school back in the day. So I think it's true. Um, I probably wouldn't stay in jury trial on it, but I think it's an interesting fact. But one of the things that I had ran into with Francis Schaefer is that many people know, I mean, I was raised in very much like rural Iowa where, you know, you're in, engaging with different ideas and secularism was really becoming something that was on the forefront. But there's a big difference between 80s, 90s Iowa versus 90s, 2000 Chicago. And it was really just the difference between urban and rural exposure. And ironically, a lot of the things that Schaefer talked about, that was just the way that I would think. I was dealing with a lot of these apologetic questions and issues. I just didn't know that I was dealing with them. So I started engaging with different students and different people, and we would have these different conversations. And I realized very quickly that I felt very much under equipped to think about these matters. And one of the things that helped me out significantly was Francis Schaeffer's book, The God Who Is There. So what I want to do today is give you a brief little intro on why we're going to talk about Francis Schaeffer and some of his big ideas and some of the big concepts and give you a couple of resources and the hopes that you will find a love for Francis Schaeffer, because not only did he help me think through these matters, he gave me a paradigm for how to actually engage these topics. And interestingly enough, by God's grace, one of my PhD advisors, his name was Dr. Bruce Little, he actually ended up being the person who oversaw the Francis Schaeffer collection. And I, at one point, met Francis Schaeffer's daughter, and I remember when they actually sort of handed over that collection, and I was there for it, and it's housed just right down the road from where I live, all of his original works and, and all these different things. So in many respects, I feel like God has used Schaefer not only through his writings, but through other people that have been influenced by his writings and other key figures. So what I want to do is give you just a brief little video here on Francis Schaefer so that you can sort of whet your appetite with him. So this is a video that I'm pulling up and it's on what's known as FrancisSchaeferStudies.com, which is with a guy named Dan Gwynn. Little advertisement moment here. Dan wrote this book titled Truth Amidst Tension, The Practical Apologetic Methodology of Francis Schaefer. And I'll put a link to that in the video. And if you click through that link, it'll actually help both Dan and myself. And Dan is a man that's kind of committed his life to studying Francis Schaefer. And this book really was just sort of the fruit of a number of years of him coming to the International Society of Christian Apologetics. And I just encouraged him, take all of your papers and kind of put them together. And one day you'll have a book out of it. And he did that for a number of years. He presented on a whole host of different 
topics and issues on Francis Schaefer, and he runs this website here. And what I want to do is play a segment from it, and I'll also put the link down here be below so that you can understand who Schaefer is. So let's listen to him here real quick. That's not Schaefer. That's just some random guy in the video. The hallmark of our generation, in contrast to the previous generations, is that this generation does not believe that truth exists in any form. All is relativistic. There is no such thing as truth as truth. The issue is clear. Is the Bible true truth and infallible wherever it speaks, including where it speaks of history in the cosmos, or is it only in some sense revelational where it touches religious subjects? God made the whole man, and the whole man is redeemed in Jesus Christ. So let's stop right there for a second. Notice what Francis Schaeffer is talking about, is that we are living in a generation that has completely abandoned or jettisoned the concept of truth. We live in an age where people think that truth is something that's an experience or it's relativistic. And many of us in the apologetics world, we go, yeah, we, we know that. Well, Schaefer, in many respects, was bringing this to the forefront of people's minds. And he was a pioneer in this regard. But notice how he keeps using this phrase. And I actually use this phrase because Schaefer uses this phrase. He calls it true truth. And a lot of people, especially internet mockers, do not like it when I use that phrase or when Schaefer uses that phrase because they think it's just redundant, like wet water. But what Schaefer was trying to deal with is the reality that we live in a world in which people talk about truth, but they have a false definition of truth. So truth is that which corresponds to reality. So whatever reality is, that's what truth is. And Schaefer would talk about people who believe in things such as like dialectical or existential truth, which is really this idea that truth is nothing more than your experiences, not that which corresponds to reality. And he would talk about how that manifests itself into the Bible. And one thing that Schaefer was very big on was just as I am a space time figure and you are a space time figure, so is Jesus Christ a space time figure. In addition, all of these events that seem so remote in the Old Testament and ideas that were given throughout the Bible or even into the New Testament, if we believe in this concept of true truth, they too are real space-time figures. That's the idea that not only has God spoken, but he's spoken in true truth and true propositional terms in the text of Scripture. So let's keep listening to him here. And the Lordship of Christ covers the whole of life. There is no use of evangelicalism seeming to get larger and larger if at the same time appreciable parts of evangelicalism are getting soft at that which is the central core, namely the scriptures. Just think about this. Schaefer was dealing with a time in which people were jettisoning the true truthfulness of the text of scripture. They were denying the inerrancy of scripture. And if evangelicalism is going to grow for whatever it is, and we're going to unhitch the Old Testament, or we're going to undo a lot of passages in the text of Scripture, Schaefer would say, there's no point to it. And he's right. You know, if we're going to jettison the authority of the Bible, we have really given up our ability to demonstrate the ways that Jesus Christ exercises his authority over the church, which is Jesus Christ exercises his authority over the church via his word. And that's what we see. And Schaefer warned of this in his book, The Great Evangelical Disaster. And ironically, so many of the things that we see throughout evangelicalism today, from wokeness to the political maneuvering to the worldliness, is nothing more than a practical fulfillment of what seem like the prophetic utterances from Francis Schaeffer. Now, I don't mean prophetic like we're Pentecostal prophetic, but in the sense that he's seeing these things and they're coming to fruition, ideas have consequences. So let's listen just a little bit more here. There is no use having greater numbers if the whole thing is diluted. A holding to a strong view of Scripture or not holding to it is the watershed of the evangelical world. Notice that the concept of scripture being the watershed of the evangelical world. 
Believing the inerrancy of the Bible is not just a test of evangelical consistency. It's a test of evangelical identity and consistency. Not only consistent with what we should believe, but it's who we are. And it's, it's a watershed moment. It's one in which all the things start to turn. And we've talked about this so many times on this channel, but if you jettison a high view of Scripture, the net result of it will be other doctrines of the Christian faith are going to fall with it. And as we've said numerous times before, that's illustrated best by Harold Lenzel's book, The Battle for the Bible. So let's finish with this little video here real quick. And what I want to do is illustrate one thing that Schaefer talked about. And I want to pull up a, a full screen picture here and talk about Francis Schaefer's concept of the line of despair. So I'm going to disappear for a second. How about you not disappear from this? In fact, if you like this, please do me a favor. Please subscribe to this video while you are, are looking at this. So I'm going to pull up what's known as Francis Schaefer's line of despair. And what I want you to see here is I want you to look at the word philosophy and then art, music, general culture, and theology. Forget the other things from now. And what he tries to describe is that ideas start at this lofty level, this line of despair, or what we could also talk about the influences of ideas, works its way out in all of these different things. So art is downstream from philosophy. Music is downstream from philosophy. General culture is downstream from philosophy. Theology can be downstream from philosophy. So whenever you're looking at a work of art or listening to music or looking at something in just general culture, you have to ask yourself, where did this come from? And Schaefer would argue, first and foremost, that ideas have consequences and that they have their ideas or their foundation and their grounding in these different aberrant ideas. So let's think about this real quick. So he gives a time of which we've, we've crossed certain pivot points in society. And, you know, those pivot points could be things like we believe in objective truth to we no longer believe in objective truth. We once believed in objective morality and we no longer believe in objective morality. And when you sort of cross that bridge, when you've crossed that line of despair where you're separating yourself from these overarching absolute universal truths and we're left with just the particulars, then it's not, well, who's right or what's right or who's moral and who's immoral. It really comes down to personal preferences and power struggles. And that's the society in which we live today. We're living in a society in which if we are nothing more than chemical reactions fighting for space and power and influence, then might makes right. And there's no way to say that you are right or I am wrong. It's just simply who has the most domination and influence that's going on within society. So I would love to talk about that more, but I have a whole video actually illustrating and talking about in great detail Francis Schaeffer's line of despair. But what I want you to think about is this, is that you, you see in society the effects of this breakdown of truth and Christianity in the West, and we see what it's doing. You know, when I look at our culture today, Francis Schaeffer gives me a way of understanding that culture. And I know a lot of people like to do, oh, I'm doing cultural theology or public theology or, or, or whatever it is. The reality is, is that we do have a place in the public sphere. Nobody wants to deny that. But Schaeffer was really very influential in showing you how you can actually understand what's going on around you. So a classic example of this could be, you walk into an art museum and you just see a flight of stairs to nothing. Well, what does that reveal? That is revealing the randomness and the disorderly concepts that are found in postmodern philosophy. If reality is really just the expressions of nothingness, there's no objective things to it, then that's reflected in your art. Or, you know, you see it in, in music. Um, for example, there's a song by John Mayer that talks about something like under the effect of like, who says that I can't get drunk or who says that I can't get high? And, and he lays out all of these things like, what, what difference does it make? Like, who says? Like, what, whatever. Like, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's an effect of abandoning the concepts of 
absolute morality. I mean, take out all the debates about, you know, Christians and alcohol or Christians and marijuana and just look at Christians and morality. Who says I shouldn't do X, whatever X may be? Who says that I just shouldn't go out and do whatever I want? And Schaefer would say, you know, that's that's a sad thing to think about. But the bigger issue is, is that you've jettisoned the concept of objective morality. So that's why when you look at this, philosophy, art, and music, and general culture are all downstream from these key ideas, and then it culminates in theology. So why do people, in so many respects, jettison this idea that the Bible is true truth? It's because they've jettisoned the idea of true truth in and of itself. And Schaefer gives us a paradigm for understanding those kinds of things. He gives us a way to evaluate not just the symptoms, but the actual cause. And when you look at it, that's so much of how the world works. You know, you go into the, the doctor's office and we realize that, yes, we do treat symptoms, but the cause is more important than the symptom. And the doctor is looking for the cause because if he can deal with the cause, he can deal with the effects. So if you're going in and you have just excruciating pain coming from somewhere and the doctor can clearly see that you have a sprained arm, well, he knows if, that if he can treat that, he can deal with the pain. But what about the ones that we don't see? Like, what if you have a brain tumor or something along those lines? The doctor's looking for that. Well, we're dealing with another form of, of a brain tumor in society. It's not just a physical brain tumor. It's the brain tumor of false aberrant ideas. And Schaefer gave us a paradigm for understanding that. That's why he talks about in the very beginning of this, this idea that we have jettisoned the concept of true truth. So what I want to do here is I actually want to bring this video back up for you. And I want you to re-listen to the first segment all over again and listen to what he has to say here. A little bit of a learning exercise for us. The hallmark of our generation, in contrast to the previous generations, is that this generation does not believe that truth exists in any form. All is relativistic. There is no such thing as truth as truth. The issue is clear. Is the Bible true truth and infallible wherever it speaks, including where it speaks of history in the cosmos, or is it only in some sense revelational where it touches religious subjects? God made the whole man, and the whole man is redeemed in Jesus Christ. So again, now you have this idea of how Schaefer is dealing with these notions of absolute truth and how that applies in society. So what that did for me is it gave me a paradigm for ministry. It gave me a paradigm for how I should preach to the people that are before me. It gave me a paradigm for how I should do discipleship because we're living with people where this is just the basic cognitive framework that they're bringing to the table. And it is our job as ministers of the gospel and or just believers within the local church to meet the people where they're at. So what I want to do now is I want to transition and I want to look at just a few more reasons why you should read Francis Schaeffer. So again, so much more of this can be found in uh, Dan Gwynn's book here, Francis Schaeffer's concept of truth amidst tension, the practical apologetic methodology of Francis Schaeffer. But what I want to do is I want to give you just one little biography, probably my favorite biography on Schaeffer. It's titled Francis Schaeffer, An Authentic Life by Colin Durins. And I'll put another link to this down below. I hope I said that right. And he just lays out just the history of Francis Schaeffer. It's a, it's a true biography because learning a lot about the man will help you understand his influence. So one more set of resources that I would encourage you to get, and I'm going to use as we talk about this, is the complete works of Francis Schaeffer right here. And it is a five volume series. In fact, you might see the other ones just right here. And they're, they're very, very good. So what I want to do here is just briefly for a couple of minutes, talk about the ones that were of most importance to me and encourage you to get this full series. So 
Francis Schaeffer should be read for the following reasons. Volume one, a Christian view of philosophy and culture. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Schaeffer should be read because he gives us a Christian understanding of how we should understand ideas and how they manifest themselves in society. And his great book, This Notion of the God Who Is There, is where he lays out his line of despair and this notion of how ideas have consequences. And one way that Schaefer really tried to work with people is he would meet them exactly where they're at and try to help them either make sense of their world or to show that they have no right understanding of the world in which they live. So for example, let's just say you are walking into a coffee shop one day and you hear these people talking about relativism and any religion can be true and they like to go out and do their vain spiritualities or whatever they're doing like that and they don't believe in objective morality and you look the person in the face and you spit in their face, you slap them in the face and you steal their wallet and you go running down the road and the man gets mad at you and he chases you down, he tackles you, he maybe smacks you in the face a couple of times, takes his wallet back, goes, gets his cup of coffee. And if you walk back in there to talk to him, one serious question you might have for him is, is that based off of a relativistic worldview, what right do you have in saying what he did, or in that case, you in that sense, was wrong? Who's to say it's wrong to steal somebody's wallet or spit in their face or slap them in the side of the face if there's no concept of objective morality. Who's to say that? And see, what Francis Schaeffer would point out is, is that you're living in an inconsistent world. You know that you've been robbed, which is an absolute moral wrong, and you react as though you've been wronged, and you go after the person as though you've been wronged, but yet you don't believe in the concept of something being wrong or evil or bad. And see, this is what Schaefer brings for us, is that we live in a world in which there are grave inconsistencies in the opposing worldviews of the non-Christian. And Schaefer is going to give you a way of evaluating them, almost in a positive sense of how can I unravel this opposing worldview and show these great inconsistencies. Now, some people are fine with living in tension, so they might say, but they don't live consistently within that tension. So Schaefer gives us this whole concept of what does it look like when this person realizes that their house is built on sand or their whole house is nothing more than a deck of cards that can be blown over? Schaefer calls this taking the roof off. So we can picture as, as children, if we had, say, some kind of toy set of some sort, and you can take the roof off and look in. Well, that's what's going on with their worldview. You're taking the security of the roof off, and they're seeing the futility of the ideas that they've been advocating as such, and they see that they're futile. And one of the dangers of such a thing is that when a person's brought to that condition, they will realize the total inconsistency and almost nihilistic concepts in which they live. And it's a very dangerous point because then life feels meaningless and it feels like it's a true element of despair. And maybe they've never seen it, but that's the truth of where they're at. And we must press that. We must press that and let them see how important that is because we have to undo the aberrant worldview. And then the hope of it is, is that we give them the truthfulness of the Christian worldview in which we put a different roof on, namely the worldview of Christianity is found in the true truthfulness of the text of scripture. And Schaefer is going to give you a paradigm for how to do that, not just on illustrations with guys in coffee shops, but in art and in music and in the history of philosophy and in dance and in all of these different arenas. He's going to equip you, as it says here, to have a Christian view of culture and of philosophy. And he does this in many respects by illustrating it in a second sense. He has another book titled, He is There and He is Not Silent. So think about this. People ask this question, is there a God? And, you know, we have 
been very good at developing different arguments for the existence of God, cosmological, teleological, moral arguments, religious affections, like all of the different ones that we've used, you know, everything that has a beginning has a cause, the universe has a beginning, therefore the universe has a cause. We see that. And in many respects, we can show from creation, there is a creator. Nobody's denying that. But what Schaefer would press is not only do they ask that question, is God there? But they ask the question, has God spoken? Because it's not enough to say that there is a God. You have to actually know that God. And you don't just have to have just an awareness of some kind of God, but we have to ask ourselves the question, how has that God revealed himself to us? Well, Schaefer's answer is, is that he is there and he is not silent. Because one, creation speaks forth of the glory of God, but also the text of Holy Scripture. I mean, we, we have the Bible, and we declare it to be the word of God. We see God is not silent in creation, and in Jesus Christ, and in the text of Scripture. And think about what this does for us. You now see that God is personal. You now see that God is someone who is actively revealing himself so that you may know not only that God exists, but the things that God would require of you. So what do the scriptures in this sense kind of principally teach? They, requ- they teach what may be known about God and what God requires of us. And the notion that he is there and he is not silent is a game changer. That is the Christian worldview. We are a people that believe in the, the book of Holy Writ, the the scriptures, the Bible, God has spoken to us in meaningful propositions. And he shows what some of this might mean in things such as the Bible or the Christian worldview of the Bible as truth. And he talks about this in his book, The, The Genesis in Space and Time, or Joshua and the Flow of Biblical History, and even some of his things such as art and the Bible. And we talk about this, that if the Bible is true, then whatever the propositions and the text of Scripture teach actually correspond in a true truth concept to space, time, and reality. So just as we exist in a true truth concept in space, time, reality, so do all of the other figures throughout the text of Scripture. If the Bible says that Adam really existed, Adam existed. If the Bible says, Abraham or David or Joseph or any of the Old Testament prophets really did something and really said something, then it is true truth that they actually existed and said particular things. And not only is it true of them, it's true of actually about Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God made flesh and promised to give us the inspired, infallible, inerrant Bible. That what we're getting here is, is this. Christian worldview, but this Christian worldview of what does it really mean to affirm that the Bible is true truth? And Schaefer is going to lay out some of the significant reasons why you should believe that. So again, I encourage you, if you want specific details on that concept, get the full works of Schaefer and read some of these books, Genesis in Space and Time, No Final Conflict, Joshua and the Flow of History, and, and so forth. Now, transitioning is that Schaefer should be read for a third reason. Namely, he gives us a Christian view of spirituality. And spirituality is a vague term today. You know, is it meditation? Is it yoga? Is it sitting out on the mountain trying to do the lotus position? And that's what I think a lot of people sometimes see spirituality as in the West. We're very much Eastern in our approach right now. Or it's something where you go and do Gregorian chants and you light candles and you know, you do the sign of the cross and, and all these different things. And Schaefer would say that is a form of spirituality. Nobody's going to deny that those are aspects of spirituality. But he's going to say that there are really a different contrasting idea of a Christian view of spirituality. And he's going to give us this idea that there are no little people within the Christian worldview. One aspect of the Christian worldview is Yes, there's a God that we pray to and we submit to the Bible and that there's the the reality of God and the reality of a conflicting worldview coming up against this. But we know certain things about people. One, every person you meet is made in the image of God. Hence, there's no little people. And they're in dire need of the gospel. Hence, gospel 
work. The work of the church is not meaningless. So he's also going to look at this idea that we need to engage these figures because they're valuable and because they need the gospel. But true Christian spirituality is more than just evangelism. It's being saved out of one world and brought into the world of the church. And we must give them a true, real, meaningful alternative to that which they've been saved out of. Now, unfortunately, we know churches have drama and churches have issues and all the rest. But Schaefer's going to try to give us this through this idea of true spirituality. And I would tell you to look at these for a good Christian view of spirituality. For the sake of time here, I want to look at his concept of a Christian view of the church. And many things that Schaefer does is he has things like the church before the watching world, the church at the end of the 20th century, the mark of the Christian, death in the city, and his book, The Great Evangelical Disaster. And I'd love to talk about each one of those. Maybe we will at some point in time. But Schaefer talks about, well, what happens when the church starts to act too worldly? And we give up the concept of absolute truth. and we give up the inerrancy of the Bible. Well, he's saying you're giving up your evangelical convictions. That's one of the key watersheds. And unfortunately, the great evangelical disaster is that we've given up both the concept of truth and the Bible as God's fully true truth revelation of himself in meaningful propositional terms. And it works itself out in the fact that we give up true spirituality. We give up true biblical engagement of culture. We give over to culture. We don't just see that the Bible tells us to preach the gospel and we can do real meaningful acts of service to real people. Rather, we say, well, Christianity is nothing more than the the social gospel, one might say, or redeeming culture for whatever that, that may mean. Or we turn, like we've seen today, people have jettisoned these concepts for social justice in society. And my big issue with social justice is not only what it says and what it claims and its net effects, but by default, social justice and wokeness and all the rest give up the concept of truth. So in that respect, the whole social justice movement is nothing more than the prophetic fulfillment of exactly what Francis Schaeffer was worrying or warning us about. So like I've said, The whole woke movement today, in that it jettisons the concept of true truth, is the prophetic fulfillment of what Schaefer warned us about when we give up true truth, the Bible as true, meaningful truth that gives us propositional theology in that sense, and what it means to rightly serve in the church and to serve in society. So now bearing with me here real quick. He also gives us this idea of a Christian view of the West. So your fifth reason is, is that Francis Schaeffer gives you a way of what it means. So how should we then live in this world? Whatever happened to the human race, his idea of a Christian manifesto for what society might look like and how we should work to overcome the dark ills of the world and the society in which we live. And Francis Schaeffer used to give this this whole notion as he would talk about the pro-life movement because Schaefer in so many respects was one of the early champions of the pro-life movement. And he would say something unto the effect of every abortion clinic should have a little sign that reads open by permission of the church because we as the church should have an influence in our society for redeeming it towards godly things. Now, We should have a free society, but we should have an influential aspect in that society. We don't want to be sort of these tyrants over it, almost like where we bring the kingship and the church back together in some integralist fashion. But we have to see that God has placed people here in the church to be the heartbeat of the morality of society because we're the redeemed people of God in that sense. And we can work to overcome the great ills that society is plagued with by the value and the integrity of the gospel. So with that said, I don't want to belabor this too long, but I would encourage you, get the works of Francis Schaeffer. Read Francis Schaeffer. Read Francis Schaeffer. Embrace Francis Schaeffer. Get, you know, the, the biography. Get Dan Gwynn's book. Get 
the complete works. So again, what we try to do here is I try to equip you in theology, philosophy, apologetics, and these different things so that you can meaningfully engage the world in which you live and the church in which you serve. Again, thank you. I appreciate all of you. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe to this channel, like the video. If you don't like the video, please mark that you don't like the video. We want interaction on it. My heart will not be hurt. My feelings will not be hurt in that regard. But again, thank you. Appreciate it.